My name is John Randall. Just so everybody uh, is aware, I'll be sort of facilitating the conversation uh, here in Vienna uh, with the people that are here on Zoom, but the session will be moderated by Aravinda and uh, Daniel. And uh, Aravinda, I believe, has some opening slides. So let's, uh, let's get underway. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for all of you who made the time to come both, um, um, both virtually as well as in person in Vienna. So we come to you from three different parts of the globe. I'm here on the East Coast of the US and uh, my name is Aravinda Chakraverdi. I'm from the NYU School of Medicine. And um, uh, I'm really mostly by training a human geneticist who works on molecular mechanisms of human disease. And uh, da Daniel, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Daniel MacArthur. I'm joining from the East Coast of Australia in Sydney where it's um, 6.30 in the evening. Um, so my, my background is largely in human genomics, uh, particularly large scale germline genetics. Um, I've, I don't have a huge amount of uh, work in single cell um, uh, directly, but I, <clears throat> we have I've recently been working with Joseph Powell at the Garvin Institute to start doing some large uh, population scale single cell work on a couple of thousand individuals with whole genome sequencing and, and uh, single cell data as well. So uh, this is a very <clears throat> timely discussion. I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing the interface between this space and the, the clinical and population genetic problems that I usually work on. Okay, thank you. So that sort of, you know, gives all of us a sense of, you know, the broad area that uh, we're going to look at. But today, um, uh, let's see. Um, so there was a session discussion, uh, description, and I'm just going to describe it very briefly to say that there's no doubt that the mapping of human phenotypes, particularly diseases, uh, both for Mendelian as well as much more non-Mendelian and complex disorders have been just absolutely phenomenal. We have tens of hundreds of thousands of associations, thousands of Mendelian genes. And even though we've gone through the mapping part, what we have in front of us is really the much more difficult um, problem of understanding pathophysiology. In many cases, we know the genes and variants. In many other cases, those are precisely the things in doubt. And what we hope to accomplish in this discussion through you, and hopefully even beyond the session today, is for all of us to think about ways in which we can improve understanding disease pathophysiology from understanding single cell biology. And we have to understand the whole spectrum from variant to gene to the pathway in which these, you know, both genes and RNAs and proteins act and exactly how they affect the biology of cells and tissues and how that eventually affects the phenotype. So this of course is important not only for clinical applications, but really to understand fundamentally the broad question, how does the genome encode any phenotype? So um, I think that this is our very crude display of what are the kinds of things we could be talking about. But of course, we expect the audience to broaden this in the many ways uh, from, from your own experience. So of course, we have to understand gene regulation that's fundamental to most complex diseases as we found out, not only the enhancers, but also the transcription factors that bind them exactly how these genes themselves are organized into regulatory networks, which we know they are, and exactly how is it that those molecular networks really define cellular properties, growth, apoptosis, or many other differentiation and such. So this is the information that we believe is critical for understanding of sequence variation in this network of many components, change cellular properties in differential phenotypes as well as in disease. And that's what we wish to discuss with you. We all have much to learn in this area. How is it that the human cell atlas can be used to find these answers? And hopefully the other way around, how does the biology really help along what we can learn from the human cell atlas? So Daniel and I came up with these questions and you can read them. I'm gonna have them up here and I'm gonna, we are gonna take turns in, trying to discuss with you each of the five. In the meantime, 
Please think of other questions. There are many others. We did not want to lead with all of the areas that we could, in fact, discuss. So submit your additional questions through the Q&A, and I think John is going to moderate both of us. Daniel and I are going to keep count on what's coming in. So first, I'm going to begin with really the simplest way in which the HCA and all of its uh, products can be used is as an annotation tool. If we have some proof that in some human disease uh, that we have a particular variant that we believe is causal, and we say, let's suppose it sits in um, very early uh, enhancer that controls the regulation of a gene, say in cell differentiation, uh, knowing all of these elements, knowing them that they act in particular cell types, not only which ones, but when they do, what these cell types are, what are the other kinds of cells that they interact with, whether we expect the effects to be cell autonomous or um, in fact, um, be non-autonomous effects, all of these are important. And I think all of us are seeing many examples in the literature of the cell type specific annotation being used to prove causality of a variant. So I think I'm going to just stop there and ask, you know, the audience to participate in both with your views of how you believe this is affecting our work, and more importantly, how we can change, uh, how we can really change our science, how our science will be affected with what we are learning from the HCA. Okay. Uh, Aravinder, that was terrific. Thank you. For the people here in Vienna, I think uh, I'm trying to figure out how you can get questions into the Q&A. I think what I'm actually going to do is pass around my email address. You can email them to me and I'll drop them into the chat uh, since I don't believe you have the Zoom link for the for the meeting. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah, or they can they can just mm -hmm. ask them aloud. Or yeah. just raise yeah, your hand. Uh, we have going. a mic here. Yeah, so yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I think we can just pass it on ourselves. Hey, uh, this is Bruce Arno, um, terrific introduction. And uh, I guess I'd throw into the mix here of what you've got, you know, you just beautifully outlined it. What is the right approach to deconvoluting um, pathophysiological causal um, activities versus counter pathophysiological activations that are present. So how do we know what are the the the, the, per, the disease causal side of things versus the compensatory responses when we you know are looking at, at disease tissues? That's one side. And then the other is like having this ultimate goal of given that if we can if we can figure out what's what's causing and what's what's um, moderating how do we boost the moderating networks in, and suppress the causal um, pathways that are operative? So that's that's uh, that's an excellent question. It's um, you know and 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 sort of very perceptive to perhaps definitions we ask before we've answered the questions that seem to l perhaps limit our answers. I think you're absolutely right. In going, say. Um, from a sequence alteration to a phenotype, let's suppose, um, there are many, many changes. And some of them lead to disease and others perhaps don't lead to disease, but lead to other kinds of phenotypic changes. Or say some of which manifest in phenotypes and others that don't. So I'm sort of, give, I, and I'm speaking generally, but um, I think in many of these areas, at least my personal thinking, and Daniel, you can, and others in the audience, please, please chime in, that uh, we are all very much affected through the examples that we study. In my case, this example comes from a defect of the enteric nervous system called Hirschsprung's disease, where enteric neurons, now we know that the reason why they are absent in the gut during development is they fail to proliferate from a precursor population, and if there's not enough of them, they never migrate down the gut and they never have enough numbers to populate the gut. Uh, 
So here, I think the ultimate uh, phenotype is not enough cells to populate the guts, enteric neurons, basically, they're not enough neurons. But uh, there are many, many other changes when we do single cell studies, both in mouse models, and now we and others are beginning to do this in, in um, human, at least gut tissue, sometimes in human embryos, but others, of course, clearly in patients were much, much older. And there are many changes, and I think it's a very open question as to how many of those changes are contributory to the process and how many perhaps are not. We all know that about, you know, that there are many, many genes. Daniel, in fact, is somebody who's worked in this area um, um, and really led in this area is you can knock out function on one of the two alleles and they may, there's not only no clinical um, consequence, but there may be few other cellular consequences we know for single gene disorders. So I, I think it's a very good question. And perhaps what you're prompting me to rethink is pathophysiology will be some part of the process. I think what we need to understand is how do we go from one end of a sequence alteration all the way to all of the changes that happen. I'd actually love to get more feedback from the audience on this point too, because I think, and it will be a point that we revisit as we get into question two here around disease specific HCAs, where obviously um, Bruce's point here will become ever more critical, potentially as we look at patient patient cells that are further on down the path, pathological process. So that you know, by, by, the, by the end state of a, of a patient's chronic disease, we might end up with the, the overall expression landscape being almost entirely dominated by secondary pathological changes. Um, but perhaps for people in the audience that do work in, in single cell analysis of pathological tissue, it'd be great to hear how they think about that problem. How do you distinguish between causal versus secondary changes? Uh, at, at least we, as Daniel, I don't know about you, as yeah, moderators, uh, we can't hear the speaker. The yeah, apologies, we wasn't able to catch any of that. You mean the call of the eyes? I think some people just might not be muted. And your yeah. kind of background audio. Yeah, that may be in the background. Now, there is a question here on the chat from Gary Bader. Uh, hi, Gary. Uh, let's be. Uh, um, and it asks. Could we ask anyone on the Zoom who isn't muted to please mute? I think we, or, or perhaps the host could mute anyone who isn't muted. Thanks. Gary, since I see you, why don't you, you can ask, ask the question yourself so that everybody could hear you. Um, sure. So um, most human cell ALICE data is currently single cell or nuclei RNA-seq. And we know that SNPs and other variant types can be detected in this data, but it's challenging to do so, um, mostly because of low sensitivity outside of the regions of the transcript that have a lot of reads uh, mapped to them, like the three prime end, sometimes the five prime end of the transcript. So I'm just wondering if people have been trying to use this information to infer, or if it's possible to infer SNP to gene expression program relationships as an example, like a EQTL type of information. So, um... Yeah, let me briefly try to answer that. And then we'll, John, you said there's a couple of questions in Vienna. Uh, we can come to. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think at this stage, we are very hard pressed to get very high quality data in a large number of cells covering many cell types, both for expression, which I think we are getting it far better at, then, for example, in probing other aspects, could be interactions, could be open chromatin or other, other features. 
I think getting to high quality calls that can um, give us genotypes as well is still very, very early. I can only speak to our own work where I think this has been very difficult. The, um, but perhaps others can, others can speak to where their experience has been. I don't think we are there yet. And my personal view is, if we are really gonna understand this process, we need to understand not only a single SNP, which may have led to the primary association or us detecting the association, but rather all of the variants in that region, because I suspect that often these effects are not only from one variant in one cis element, but perhaps multiple variants in multiple elements. Maybe if I could just add maybe another way of stating this question is what kind of data do we need or what kind of um, information should we try to be getting out of the data? Like for instance, maybe we should, you know, be genotyping more people or maybe in, in the HCA or maybe we should um, be focusing instead of that, maybe that's not feasible. Maybe instead of that, we should be trying to infer gene regulatory networks, as you mentioned, uh, Aravinda, that like this data is rich, especially with multi-ohm, ATAC, seq, RNA-seq data, we can really start getting a lot of information about cell-specific and cell-state-specific gene regulatory networks. And maybe that's the rich data that HCA is gonna produce that will help genetics in some way. So I, you know, I just wonder what the right fit is for all this data and questions. Um, I mean, so go ahead, uh, Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, so um, certainly you can you can apply if you have sufficiently large numbers of cohorts with gene, both genotype and single cell expression data, including that three prime end mapping data. You can run EQTL analyses, um, same as you would for for bulk transcriptome data, but uh, albeit with the extra statistical challenges of sparsity that you get from the single cell data. Um, there's a there's a few papers out there now around this space, Joseph's. Joseph Powell's team has a, a recent paper um, in science looking at a, a thousand individuals with uh, with PBMCs, um, showing that you, you know you, you find a whole host of cell type specific EQTLs using using that approach. Um, it's it's clear though I think there's still there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of um, improving the the overall statistical methods here, um, moving beyond, for instance, the idea of discrete cell types into continuous approaches to mapping QTLs. So work done by Ali Stagel's group and others, others around that. Um, and, and then longer term, I, I think there probably is a hard limit on how much we can learn from this three prime tag information and the value of getting whole transcript sequencing data from much larger numbers of individuals with a harmonized collection of the underlying cells, you know, would that, that'll be immensely powerful data. Um, but as, as far as I know, there's not yet a, a really large data set of uh, individuals with unified collection of, of cell type data with whole transcript sequencing data as well as genotype. If anyone knows of one, I'd love to hear more about it. No, I was just going to add that I think for the purpose of annotation, and then perhaps we can move um, just in the interest of time to the next question, that for the case, sake of annotation, I think right now we are always so delighted when we get some kind of cell type annotation in any given system, doesn't matter the adrenal or early in gut development, whatever. But I think much of the power will come from comparative analysis as it has in the sequence. So first, as Daniel said, I think we need much higher resolution sequence with the samples. I think all samples should have a base genome sequence. I think that's gonna turn out to be extremely important just for the interpretation of the data. The other is I think we will get to the point where uh, we will look at the contributions of what the cell structure and functions look like in different samples. And uh, I don't necessarily mean only geographic variation, but truly from different samples to know how much of the variation is technical, how much of it is biological, what the causes of that biological variation is. And without knowing that distribution of variation, it will be very difficult to say, whether we are in the middle, whether we are at the extremes. So I anticipate there will be not only multiple samples to be used in a comparative way in the same domain, but also much better sequence resolution for what we do. 
Uh, Arvind, do we have one comment in the room here? Uh, could we Please. maybe call on Please. this and go to the next question? Please. Hi, Daniel, it's Kristen. Um, I just wanted to uh, add to what you were saying, which is that a lot of the discussion yesterday in several of the groups um, and around the uh, focused around genetic diversity as well, um, it became clear that <clears throat> a lot of these early studies don't have the genetic information, but I agree fully with you. There's just not enough we can extract from calling SNPs from three prime regions only. We really do need this genetic information. And I think there's a growing recognition of that. So some of the studies that some of us are engaged in are doing that, but I think more so, um, especially the studies focusing on adding in ancestral and geographic diversity, realize the key importance of that. Um, and it, it's really important going forward. Um, and I guess to the, uh, we jumped to it and then jumped back from it, the disease specific atlases. I think one of the things that at least some of the projects I'm engaged with are realizing is critical is that if you're looking at sort of cell transcriptomes and features from a normal to a disease endpoint and as brought up earlier here too, that they're really very different. And ideally what we want, if we're going to use patient samples for some of these not cell models, getting the more intermediate phenotypes to look at is going to be far more impactful and informative of the disease progression and processes. Could, Kristen, could you spell out a bit more by 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 what you need mean by intermediate phenotypes here and perhaps give a few examples? The, uh, well, I was talking about the disease specific uh, atlases. Mm -hmm. Is that what, yeah. So yeah, I exactly. think, yeah, do we, I mean, in the studies that we were looking at, um, there's a recent one, uh, Patrick Eleanor's lab, uh, looking at sort of disease to normal, yeah. but the disease endpoint is so vastly different than the normal um, that everything's different. So really finding out the processes that are involved in that and the progression from, especially when we're interested in genotypes with small effects for some of these diseases, starting somewhere in the intermediate and having um, low level phenotypes or phenotypes that are progressive towards the disease without being the end point are far more informative in giving you ideas for what's going wrong at the cellular regulatory network level. Perfect. Yeah, that's really helpful. I wasn't, um, I wasn't sure if you meant intermediate phenotypes in the sense of like some sort of biochemical marker um, or intermediate phenotypes in the sense of, of disease progression. So getting people at multiple different points along the time course course of disease. Yeah, disease progression really to understand yeah. the the, phenot the cellular phenotype of what's happening. Excellent, that's great. Thanks. And of course, you know, to to the degree that we can actually get good cellular models, those will be useful as well in terms of being able to again track those cellular models across multiple different points during the progression towards the disease state. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, do you have a quick comment, and then we should move to the next question? I think. Uh, just delicious discussion. Um, it, just going backwards a little bit, um, where are you guys who are so deep into into association and causal genetics? Um, where, where, how are you thinking now about association alleles versus causal alleles, and then how do we kind of more consistently put those into a network of, and and then how are we thinking that? modifier alleles are participating in a network what are the possibilities of of you know in in with respect to causation or suppression suppression or lack of suppression of a, of a you know a causal primary that's that's not necessarily connected to those variants per se is that and, and so i think we need a a more consistent framework for you know for placing an individual patient's um, you know variants into that network of a, of the the universe of of all of the associations we know, and then and then kind of projecting that onto cellular um, functions, dysfunctions, and cellular interactions. Um, you know, it, it goes to the to the level of of. Uh, you know, dysfunctional single protein or a dysfunctional regulatory element or, a, you know, a dysfunctional cell-cell interaction. Is this, you know, it's, it, I, all this stuff sort of swims in our minds when we're, you know, trying to, to come up with how is this stuff all linked? And then, and then you know, how are we going to suppress it? And, and then, or how are we going to prevent it, you know, from, from, you know, transitioning over to a, you know, a severe disease state that, that accompanies these risks? Love to hear your thoughts. 
So I'll, I'll just um, I'll just give you at least what my biases are. Um, you know, there's so much of um, of really confirmed replicated associations across the genome. I think we know the general patterns uh, in human disease, and they include, I would say, both rare as well as common disease, although mostly common. That I think in order to get to the level of detail, um, like throughout the history of genetics, uh, that um, I think we will need some model systems. And I don't mean model systems by saying that they're gonna be yeast versus zebra fish or something else, even though they are model systems. But I think there could be that uh, we need a very complete or a near complete dissection of a few phenotypes, which are chosen that uh, in such a way that they could answer some of these questions. I don't think that the rules for whether it's a single association, multiple associations, only some of which are causal in many genes affecting many cell types and affecting a phenotype is gonna be unique to any one disease, even though the number, the magnitude and the interactions may vary from one phenotype to another. And I'm not saying that there should be a committee that decides what these examples are. I think through our work across across the world, the different people will focus on different kinds of examples that illuminate some of them. So I'll just uh, speak to one. I think I have a particular bias that some of these kinds of lessons will come from looking at early developmental defects. And the reason is because they, although they should not be the only ones, and probably because they are the phenotypes that are closer to the genetic defects. There are some in which they are not single gene diseases, but really the effects of multiple genes, perhaps the effect of a single regulatory network. And there are some of these that could be used to figure out essentially the questions you were asking. They will not be complete answers, but I think they will help us define the next set of questions much better. And I think this is my personal opinion that that's where often um, we perhaps will get to a better specificity of the questions we will ask and the experimental paradigms that will answer them rather than doing it in mass on all phenotypes at all times, which I think was possible for GWAS, which is possible for sequencing of Mendelian phenotypes, but in this case is going to be far more difficult. That, that, that's my personal opinion on how to do this. And even define, when you say modifier, if there are many, many things, I think when we get to unravel them, it may be modifier in the plural. And then, so. Could I suggest we uh, take a couple of questions here and then we get back to Gary's, the, the latest question that Gary has in the chat. And I think our first questioner here may actually have a comment on the current question as well, yeah. so. Hi, I'm Mike Fletcher. I'm an editor at Nature Genetics. So I have a couple of comments on, firstly, Bruce's question about causal inference. Mendelian randomization is a standard GWAS follow-up to do that kind of thing. So there are definitely methods in you know, the association world to try and do this. Um, a comment about trying to genotype from RNA data. Like, I think if I think of large scale QTL studies, you know, with bulk tissues, right? The ones that are out there mostly now, I don't think, I can't think of many examples where people have done that using genotyping from transcriptome data. Like, you know, to get high quality genotypes, you do need, um, better coverage than that. And I mean, it, it can be arrays, you know, it doesn't have to be sequencing now where we have reference panels where you can impute quite accurately these, uh, the, the other variants that are in LD. So I think, you know, and arrays are cheap. And if you can do it, I think it's just, it's much better than trying to do it technically, right? Like this is my impression. I don't have any hands-on experience. And if I may, I, I was looking at question four. And so I handle a lot of statistical genetics com computational methods and statistical geneticists are very excited by single cell data of various types. But I would say that the one thing I've noticed in uh, you know, just being here in the last couple of days is that people are thinking in terms of at a higher level in genes, they're thinking of cell states and they're thinking of like gene programs. But I think statistical geneticists are still thinking at the level of genes. And so, yeah, like I, I, I sort of noticed that comment about whether yesterday, whether we need to get ge accurate gene expression measurements out from these latent uh, embeddings. And I think this is like, 
yeah, like for the end user, for at least the end users who I have experience with, I think they would want gene level, accurate gene level measurements. Uh, yeah, that's all. And Kristen, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, can I just add to that? I, I think um, tying Bruce's question and the responses all together there, there is when you're when you're stepping down from a sort of GWAS gene based um, EQTL based studies, we end up with these, as Aravinda said, very strong associations, and mostly they get us to a gene, which doesn't say it's a gene alone that's causal, that it's not a network or anything like that, but mostly they get us to a gene or close to a gene. And if we can start with one and find out, then I think we can branch into the interactions, but we have to start somewhere. And I think one of the key things that single cell data does is that we've ended up in this morass of not knowing where that gene's functioning. So how, how it does that. And the first thing these data sets are providing us is an insight into the cellular context of, of that. So stepping forward, once we do that, we can look at the milieu in which it's can, you know, in, in which it's interacting, the, the the context of the cells around it in a given tissue. As Daniel said earlier, you know, and we saw it through GTEx and other studies, we keep the more we understand about the cellular level, we more the more we find that these effects are cell type specific. And that's where we're trying to get so that we can then use the right models and understand the, the greater network and the interactions and the developmental stages in which things are working as well. Um, the, there's, I mean, there, there are the largest numbers of single cell studies out at present are based in the blood, um, because they're easier to, easier to access as, as Daniel knows, easier to multiplex. Um, so they're almost all blood studies. There's a couple of us I'm engaged in one. Um, there's a couple more I know of that are at the tissue level, which are harder than necessarily single nucleus data, but we're definitely getting there on them. Um, and then I think most of the sort of studies that are in that are interested in uh, global genetic variation are trying to consider how we can get that depth across populations to understand genetic differences and population environmental differences. So it's really nascent, I'd say right now, but the blood studies are further ahead than some of the others, but they're definitely, it's a growing field. Uh, shall we go to Muz next? Hi, Muz Hanifa. Um, welcome, Sanger Institute. Um, I, I have a question about numbers and numbers relating to tissues, more logistics, really, because some tissues are very easy to access, like PBMC, but other tissues are not going to be easy to access. And generally, we're looking at hundreds, thousands, population level samples, but you know the single cell field hasn't kind of quite got there yet uh, in, in many ways. So how, you know, what should sort of people who are generating the data be thinking about in terms of what numbers they need for what, for the types of tissues, uh, you know, with respect to accessibility and the logistics? You know, one good example is developmental tissues. I mean, we're never really going to be looking at high numbers. So are there guidance or, or guidelines or some sort of, you know, framework as to how people who are generating these types of data can can use to sort of think about how their data would be useful or how they can generate data that's sufficient to allow these types of variation to be um, extracted from. I'm actually going to suggest throwing back to Kristen, Kristen, if you're okay with that on this, just because I don't know of anyone else who's thought quite so deeply about how to access mini tissues throughout the body at, at population scale. Yeah, Maz, your question is a power one, really, and it depends on this, um, you know, the effect size of what we're trying to look at, the um, uh, the frequent the 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 numbers of cells in a given tissue. So we did some sort of calculations of this at the Broad with Jesse Engreitz a while back, and you know, for heart tissue where there's maybe four or five cell types, you know, and roughly equal proportions, or yeah, you know whatever they are, compared to the gut where there was many, many more, many rare cell, cell types, then you need to sequence deeper and you need more individuals. So it, those are the sort of parameter space you're in. That said, um, you know, we were estimating, okay, um, uh, 
because we're no longer looking at a heterogeneous cell population, we're in theory looking at within a cell population that should be pure, the signal should be clearer. So that buys us a little bit of, you know, that gives us a little saving grace. So I think we estimated that if we could start in the, you know, 150 to 300 range as a sample, we'd be okay. Whereas in the bulk tissue data, we needed at least a thousand, right? Um, we're probably going to need more. I think the blood studies will illuminate that, um, especially because, you know, they have a clearly defined set of cells and cell phenotypes. Um, but it is really hard. So I can tell you the studies that I'm engaged with are about 150 to 300 samples right now, simply because that's about what we can get. And the development studies are going to be trickier still because you're going to have changes. So you have to, you're looking at something that's continuous and you may have to do it with allele specific methods and other statistical methods and, um, you know, and, and leverage data from adults as well. So it, it is difficult. But yes, if we can get anything approaching the, hun the couple of low hundreds, we're a huge plus right now in the tissue world. Just a random question, but have you considered using, do you have tonsils in the mix? Tonsils are quite hard to get from deceased donors anyway, not from um, tonsillectomies probably, but yeah, I, I so, don't have that. <laughs> yeah, so one thing, one thing to consider here, I think it's already been brought up and, and there is, um, I don't know that there is only one kind of sample that we will learn from. Um, I think, yes, development in adult tissues produce different challenges as do studies in models such as the mouse versus the human. And um, as many of you know, sometimes getting, uh, being confident that we have an unbiased sampling of the cells from a given tissue from dissociation is itself uh, quite difficult. So, um, and of course they can bias the results. So I, I, I think there's a lot of development in that area that is happening going to happen. Uh, the only thing to add from the last discussion is they're now good, obviously, you know, barcoding and tagging methods by pooling many, many samples. There are a couple of new papers in cell again on, on the immune system as um, or immune cells from blood studies with lupus, for example, again, in the hundreds of individuals. And these are turning out to be very, very powerful. Uh, and, uh, but you know, a rough rule of thumb is one, ten, hundred, then a thousand. That is, for many tissues, getting even the first cell map is is very powerful. Uh, and of course, having tens and hundreds of samples would just increase the power of the kind of phenotypes that are being addressed. But ultimately, I'm sure we will need even far more than that to increase the resolution of the kind of questions we can answer. So. But, but getting hundreds across a number of major tissues is, is difficult. And I think the answers we will get will beg the questions. I think Christine just said of the heart, which is another organ that we study. Yeah, there are four or five, there's one cell type that dominates. But as we study the human cell map, we will become aware of many other types, many other rare cell types. There are immune cell types in the heart, for example, that could be very important in disease. So I think this will just be a new awareness of us all. Um, uh, Gary, I know Gary has a couple of new questions to introduce. We do have one more comment in the room here. So maybe if you could address that and then uh, Gary has been waiting very patiently. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. So we'll go back to him. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, so I'm Michaela, from Helmholtz, uh, Michaela Müller from Helmholtz Munich. So I was um, going back to questions uh, one and two, like how to use the HCA as an annotation tool or building new atlases, essentially. Um, I was just wondering because we we kind of dis uh, we did discuss uh, to in uh, increase the you know the quality at a gene level um, in terms of full uh, full gene sequencing. But I'm just wondering, uh, most of the resources out there um, in the HCA on, on the single level, uh, single cell level um, don't necessarily have that information. Um, and uh, if we, um, so if the question is to use the, the data that we currently have and to kind of exploit us, uh, you know, from that as much as we can, because we already have a lot of resources there, um, how how will we best do that? Is like, is, would, there, would it be an option to... Um, say connect the 
global vari uh, the global uh, genomic variants with a cell, um, single cell uh, transcriptomic profile, or would it be something, or, or will we be more interested in connecting genetic variant uh, variants in um, in uh, on the transcriptome level? Part of like your suggestion, I think, is could we have an automated um, genome section? At least it's open to the scale possible of the data to the data set. So there's a first hash of the you know, at least ethnic level um, genetics that's there in, in every data set that we have had as a standardized implementation. Uh, yeah, probably. So I was like uh, wondering how much of the inf information we currently have now would uh, be useful uh, for these types of questions before we think about creating, um, of course, like generating new data is also an important question, but like, what do we, like, how much can we use the data we have now? Thanks. So I think, I think that will depend on the question that you ask. For some, some of that existing data would be very helpful, but I think if you really want to understand any process at the level of cells and other cells that interact with those cells, we will, of course, will need to do all of these, but it's not only get much better, for lack of a better word, catalog um, of what these tissues look like when dissected across many individuals of varying backgrounds, but also um, to do so in disease specific ways to see how much they change. Uh, I think I said in the beginning that none of us really have enough experience, except in a few phenotypes now, to know the extent to which how many, you know, these human cell atlases need to be built. I think there's a primary one that we will all depend on, but then they're sort of just like there wasn't a single human genome, I think they will sort of diversify very rapidly. Um, both, both in, in normalcy as well as in disease specific ones. Um, but Gary, you've been waiting for a while and you have a number of comments and, and questions. So perhaps you can just uh, bring, up, bring up the ones that sort of- Can um, I, sorry, Gary, I, I apologize. We keep on putting you off. Uh, can we have one, one more quick comment from Kristen and then we'll get to Gary? Okay, sure. I, I just wanted to say a quick um, uh, response to, to that question is, and we've been discussing it here over the last few days, is in terms of using genetic data that can be pulled from SNPs on Five Prime, and we had a couple of discussions, and that, if nothing else, um, it, it it's not what we need for doing studies like QTL studies, but it can be used to do what we do in genetics all the time, which is to define... Um, uh, you know, genetic ancestral diversity. Uh, if you don't have information, or you've got self uh, self defined um, uh, ancestry, so there's enough information there to do that. And so, using the information we have to see if we can start mapping some of these differences. The other thing is that the the data and the maps in and of themselves in defining which genes are expressed in which cell types is already the type of thing without having a one-to-one -one link where we can take our GWAS studies and genes and do integrative analyses to get insights into, uh, you know, in our existing studies, what's more likely to be causal and what's acting in a cell type. So there's a lot of information just from the annotation and from these cell type maps alone that we can get that we can use as a first pass to infer our disease genetic studies. Sorry, Gary. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, no problem. I just wanted to. Um, so I, I threw a number of questions into the chat. We can come to those anytime. But I just wanted to um, comment on a point. I think it was Michael Fletcher, if I caught the name right, made, uh, from Nature Genetics, made earlier about um, how. Uh, you know, statistical geneticists have focused mostly on genes, but in the HCA, we're, you know, at this meeting, there's a lot of discussion about gene regulatory programs. I think that's, that's a really important point. And I think one of the major conceptual advances that we've made in biology based on single cell genomics is better understanding of multicellular programs. So there's frequently gradients that we see in single cell RNA-seq data that can only be detected if you think about hundreds of cells. Um, so these cells are working, you know, you can't identify them from an individual cell. Um, these program, these gene regulatory programs, um, you know, basically represent groups of cells that are working together, ecosystems, some people are calling them. 
Um, and the, um, it, what's pretty clear is that these gradients are often tuned, like in, an inflammatory gradient T cells, you can, or macrophages, you know, for instance, we're studying um, macrophages that in two different rat strains, um, they, they're tuned to uh, react more or less to the environment. Um, and there are specific mutations that we can see between those rat strains that, you know, presumably are causing that, right? So it's not just a um, individual um, gene that's, you know, we, we should think about, I think it's, it's sort of the, 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 the aspect that's selected for is the whole ecosystem of cells and how it works as a system to do something like respond to an inflammatory signal or something like that. Um, and um, so, it, you know, that would be a great message, I think, to send back to the statistical genetics community if they don't know that um, to, uh, or maybe that's a good conversation of, you know, transcriptomics and statistical genetics to, to have how we think about how mutations are tuning these um, continuous systems that, that we see frequently in single cell RNA-seq. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, Gary. I, I think one of the anyway one of the remarkable things, at least to me, remarkable things is even though we have a huge and perhaps close to an infinite number as a mathematician, I know it's not infinite, but a very large amount of sequence variation and even phenotypic variation across individuals. When you come to RNA, the the the, um, the dimensionality is far less. And which is why, you know, you can, one can discover trajectories even from across multiple samples or multiple species and so on. So there is some, uh, I think that's an important point. And uh, some are trying to sort of delve into that. That is rather than focusing on a single variant or even a gene um, that we will have to consider the meaning of variation in some other larger unit, because clearly, Many RNAs are, or many transcripts are co-regulated. And even though we don't understand the exact basis of co-regulation, we have to take into account the fact that these kinds of other correlations exist. So that, that is an important point that there may be ways in which the HCA teach us how to reduce the dimensionality of this, you know, huge amount of sequence variation that the recombination map creates. Uh, and that may be very helpful to understanding the relationship between variation and, and human disease. Um, I'm just gonna suggest we've sort of talked about a number of things that have delved over questions one, two, three, four, and you've raised a number of new ones that, um, that perhaps we can sort of focus on number three. I mean, we've been speaking generically of the cell map. Some of it comes from, again, model systems. Some of them come from human, you know, patient-derived material. Uh, but of course, there's always in these kinds of studies, um, often we can learn much from patient-derived, for example, induced pluripotent stem cells because they can be differentiated far more under an investigator's control, if you will. And therefore, this brings up a question brought up earlier of getting not the disease state, but perhaps states before that I'm using the word state very loosely here. And I'm just wondering whether what many of you uh, think of this route of getting iPSCs and using the differentiated cells to learn uh, many aspects of human, you know, of human phenotypes. I mean, what's the relative importance of this? Of course, it is important. And do you think there should, needs to be some concerted effort of doing so in one or a few systems to um, for our studies. If, if, if no one else wants to jump in, I can maybe have suggest a, a few thoughts to start with. So one, um, one key question, of course, here is around scale with the, the given the expense of generating IPSCs, particularly fully clonal IPSCs being so substantial, um, is that we've 
to do this at the scale that's necessary, especially if we're going to be doing this across many different disease types, we, we are going to have to make some fairly fundamental advances in, in IPSC generation. And that may mean reducing the fidelity of these systems, right? So thinking about potentially just going for polyclonal IPS lines rather than trying to make them fully clonal, um, trying, to, trying to figure out what the, what the requirements are to, to ascertain that they're still high quality, but, but, um, but not take them down that full route of, of clonality. And then there's a, there's another set of questions around the differentiation process. So what 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 is our goal in differentiation for IPSCs? Is our goal here to come up with a set of differentiation pathways that faithfully recapitulate existing tissues so that we have cells at the end of that that we really feel confident are actually equivalent to the cells that would exist in in situ in in human biology, or would we would we feel comfortable with a, a set of differentiation paths? That just maximize the expression states that exist at the end. In other words, we're sort of exploring um, cellular phenotype space in a way that isn't intended to, to be a, a fully faithful recapitulation of the biology of, of a specific lineage. Um, so those, those are some of the questions that I, I think about certainly, but that, that question of, of scale and how we can actually reach that, that scale across many disease areas seems like the most important one. Yeah, this is particularly true for many CNS diseases, because even though we can study some bit of it in early development and we can do animal models, it's so difficult to, right? It's impossible to get any material from any of the CNS major disorders that one would be interested in, except in upon really upon either surgery or upon death. And so that... Um, I think is very, very challenging, it's particularly so when in many neurodegenerative diseases where we know, at least from IPSCs and other kinds of cell work, that they clearly are processes that we know change over time. So, so I, but the challenge that you bring about more before scale is that um, I, I really, it would be interesting to get views from others. To me, a model is a model. It, I, I don't know how accurate cell models can be made as a faithful you know, reproduction, but even if it's going down some pathways that we understand well, I think initially they could be very, very valuable. Um, but there are others there in the room? Oh, uh, yes, we have one more question from Jessica. Please. Just a comment on that. I think, um, I don't know necessarily about IPSCs, but I know within our gut cell atlas, we're working a lot with organoids. Um, and right. it's very, right. it, it, it really, okay. You really have to understand the question that you're asking and really understand how well your model recapitulates disease. Um, so there's no like blanket statement. Yes, it's gonna work. It's gonna be very context specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I didn't want to just restrict it to just IPSCs, but obviously the starting material, um, there are, you're right, in the gut, I think the organoids have proved to be very useful. They are, I think, increasing efforts by some, even for, you know, for other tissues, which are turning out to be very helpful. So, so I, I agree with you. I think the problem with biology is almost everything we will learn is going to be context specific, but that's, that's both uh, the surprise as well as the fear sometimes, but uh, you still can generalize. Other, other comments? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say that I think of IPSCs like the organoids, like the others, as a model system um, and potentially one that we can edit and change and being cognizant of Gary's comment and others that we're looking at networks and interactions and this is still just a simple system but I, I'm I'm just not entirely clear and I don't know if this is the question you were asking Daniel as to what is the real value of getting a large number of these from patient derived populations especially if we're assuming small genetic effects do we really think that having it from a given patient will recapitulate something or is that going to be more powerful where we have um, maybe stronger rare effect things? I, I think a million GWAS small effect um, patient derived IPSCs, I, I, it's, I'm still not clear on what we're going to learn from those. 
So this is sort of in a, now not as a moderator, as a participant, let me push back on that a little bit. I, I, it doesn't matter what the IPSCs or whether they're organoids. I think an individual effect that we often estimate is small, but uh, or the specific effect, but for an individual who eventually becomes affected, say with some disorder, let's say multiple sclerosis, that individual doesn't have only one variant. That one individual typically has many, many variants. So I think the difference between us trying to understand the effect of one variant or a group of variants on one gene or a network um, is not antithetical, but quite different from understanding what happens in an individual who is clinically affected and whose effects is cumulative across all of the meaning all of the genes in their genome. So, um, so the question of scale here, and even if it's tens or even if it's hundreds of individuals, is to understand the different ways in which somebody, uh, meaning anybody can become clinically affected. Um, and we know this from um, that, you know, we know this from polygenic risk scores that not everybody is at the same degree of risk. It could be because we just don't recover the risk well today, but that individuals get affected at very different rates with very different background risk. But some of those individuals have um, the accumulation of many, many genetic defects and understanding those, at least I would expect, would be helpful in understanding how the phenotype changes and how diseases come about. And just to add another layer of complexity, what we've found um, looking at organoids at least is that stem cells have memory so that if you take a organoid, derive it from an uninvolved area versus an actively inflamed area, it's going to behave differently um, as an organoid. So, you know, getting multiple organoids from the same individual or across individuals at different stages of disease will also give us information. So there might be a, um, an area where having, where scaling will actually give you more information. Thank you. Thank you. That's correct. So in the interest of time, Daniel, we have another 25 minutes, right? Uh, um, can we get to questions four and five? Four, I think is Sure. Right. Yeah. Sort of important area. Yeah. Yeah. No. It would be definitely good to get feedback on on this. This is this is really a question around the the way that we might infer cellular properties based on expression profiles, and we've touched on this in various different ways already. You know how how robust an estimate of biological properties of a cell can we actually derive from the expression profiles in general? Um, question would be interesting to hear from this group. Is the 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 way we should be thinking about statistical and computational approaches to make those connections, how easily can those be derived at scale, um, and and how might those be used, I guess, in large scale uh, experiments where we're looking at large numbers of individuals with both genetic data and cellular expression data uh, to attempt to infer properties of, of biology. So um, yeah, would welcome in, any any thoughts broadly about methodological problems in this in this space and uh, the approaches that people see as the most sensible moving forward? Uh, we have a comment here uh, from Michaela. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to add like a uh, general comment idea or thing that we should also consider. So in the last um, couple of sessions, we also mentioned data integration a lot. And if we're talking about scaling up, um, you know, that's always that's always an issue, um, integrating multiple data sets and batch effects, um, especially on the expression space. So I um, I would just, yeah, I just want to say that um, it is very important to keep in mind um, that uh, we do need some type of integration for uh, to be able to use a bigger data set. And that would also kind of affect how we, um, um, so if we're looking at statistical models, uh, that will also affect what type of analysis we could do and also the uh, the results um yeah considering whether we for example work on a corrected feature space um or if we stick to um uncorrected expression um yeah so i think that's kind of something to keep in mind 
Thanks, Michaela. Hmm. I guess. Aaron Rist from the Klarman Family Foundation. Uh, this, as someone who's sort of an outsider here, how are you thinking about multimodal integration? I'd love to hear the team and how you're approaching that across different modalities. Modalities meaning different omics, different classes of omics data. Well, so it's a million dollar questions. Um, I mean, there are, uh, I'm just wondering whether there's um, some in the audience who can comment on what their early successes have been. Um, that speaks to what the challenge is. I, I, um, Do we have a comment here? Yeah. Yes, um, obviously not an answer, only comments. Um, <laughs> Please. My name is Stefan. I'm from the Research Center for Molecular Medicine here in Vienna. And um, I mean, these are connected, the integration, also multi-omics integration. And I think everyone, uh, especially on the biomedical side, who sees single cell papers loves dimensionality reduction. Every, every paper needs a UMAP, right? And even this dimensionality reduction method already provides you with the possibility to combine models. Models meaning in the background of a UMAP, it's uh, quite a complex process and you can model each modality on its own and then combine them and thereby get all the modality information into one view. I don't see it done. I don't know why, um, but um, that would be one answer to the multiomics. And yeah, the integration part I think is Depending on the question, similar to what um, you said about organoids and IPCs, you have to know your question. I think a general integration approach is not the way to go. So if you want to integrate to find, for example, cell types to increase your power and then find all your cell types in your data set, it's often a first goal. Then I would go back to the cell types of interest and restart my analysis, for example, with integration or just already using the raw data. So these are two comments. Thank you. So obviously there's a number of papers where people have in quote integrated. Uh, it's a different kind of integration. For example, um, data on gene expression at the single cell with those from open chromatin like a taxi, because ultimately you need to combine both of them on a gene by gene basis just to understand what the local state looks like. But I think one way of doing this is we don't still have effective models how uh, the multiple layers in going from DNA to RNA to proteins to other, say people are going to do metabolomes and others, or even look at methylation is, um, one is statistical integration, the other is a very model dependent integration that suggests how one layer of data um, Meaning, what are the rules that allow you to map one layer of data to the one below? And, um, but this kind of statistical learning has been done in other areas. Um, and uh, so, so I just, I think what that brings up is we need newer kinds of, newer kinds of methods and learning methods uh, on how to connect one layer of biological data to the next higher complexity, for example, in going from DNA to RNA to protein, even let alone other properties that are downstream. Uh, Stefan, it's another question. Yeah, no, another comment. I mean, I don't know if I understood correctly, but I do not necessarily agree that we have to focus on the gene space. So when you said single cell attack sequencing and we map it to the gene space to make it um, comparable to single cell RNA sequencing, I think the inherent nature of all these model modalities should be accounted for being very different feature spaces. So one is, for example, in single right. cell attack, we usually do not map to genes, we map to peaks. And even that I would um, advise against, I would just use, for example, an unbiased approach of tiles, like um, 250 base pair tiles, and then you quantify just the reads you get there. So you have already 
very different feature spaces that are incredibly different in terms of magnitude. So the same model will be have a hard time, but modeling them each and then having a learning function that can combine these modalities could even include um, clinical data that is very low dimensional. Um, for example, I don't know, white blood cell counts from a certain time point in a leukemia. I think, I think that's an excellent okay. point and a good reminder of the risks of potentially throwing away information by inferring, for instance, gene state too early from, from a taxic data by, by linking peaks to a particular gene up front. That's a, that's a great point. No, I didn't say, I didn't, I, I think all I was saying is there are a number of studies that have done that and that that's in the literature, whether that's the best way or not, of course, use will tell us whether that's the best way to go. Uh, But Daniel, this, uh, this is not only to you, but you could give your comments. And I think this has come up a little bit in the earlier part that um, are there some ways in which even for some very basic questions on um, numbers of cells, genes that are expressed, uh, which cell types they expressed in, and you know, just even the very basic structures that um, there can be some effort in really trying to estimate of how large the data sets need to be for a defined level of power. I don't know whether you know of such studies or others are doing these kinds of studies to, as a very rough guide, well, you know. Um, um, sound, sounded like Kristen and and others had, had done some work in that space. Kristen, is that, um if you're still there, is is that work that's published yet or is it is it on the way to being published? Because I, I agree having those those um even just thinking about what are the parameters that we should be that we should be considering in study design frequency of cell types um, distribution of effect sizes how do we integrate those together into power calculations while designing studies that would be really helpful there yes and no there are definitely things being published i think uh shoma had just published um, a, a paper on that um so in terms of those estimates of, you know, uh, expression space, cell numbers, and thinking of studies like QTLs, people are thinking of that right now and trying to estimate what the biggest bang for the buck is. Um, I was unclear if the question here pertained to um, whether, you know, the sort of activities that are ongoing here at the AC HCA of, you um, you know, how many cells are needed to really define um, uh, gene expression and, ra and rare genes and things like that. And those are the analyses that are ongoing here at this meeting among the various bio networks for uh, how many samples they need. And then the challenges of trying to integrate across different data sets um, and not lose the biological signal with the noise. Um, but uh, separately, these the calculations of what we need if we're going to do single cell QTLs are being done, but there's not a lot published on them right now. So that just says that, that that is an immediate question to answer, um, immediate in the sense it would be good for any people to sort of contribute to this because um, Kristen, the, the questions that you raised on the basic sort of, cell and sample numbers we need for the HCA are somewhat different than what we will need for studies of human disease, even relatively, uh, I, I should say, disorders with a relatively simple genetic architecture. Um, even, even for a Mendelian disorder, um, in many cases, which by the way, we all worry about complex disorders, but for the vast majority of Mendelian disorders, it's not like, the phenotype of how one goes from a gene or a phenotype to a phenotype is well understood. So that may be one place to begin to try to answer these questions. Aravinda, do we want to tackle question five at this stage? Yeah, um, I think question five. Um, Many of you have already commented on it in a number of ways, uh, but 
this sort of goes back to, you know, I think this aspect I already raised that in many human diseases, it, but by the way, I'm using the word disease broadly here, any human phenotypes, there's been a lot of work over a long time, but particularly the last five years where it's clear that let's not talk about whether it's additive or has <laughs> some other effect that the increased risk of some individuals come from combination of uh, combining the effects of many different risk alleles. And uh, so in order to understand, it's not like there's normalcy and then there's disease or non-disease and disease. All of many of you have brought up the fact that there's a whole spectrum. There may be intermediate phenotypes truly intermediate phenotypes in the way it's been classically noted, as well as early phenotypes of disease. Um, I'm just wondering that if we are to begin to thinking of human phenotypes and answer all these very broad questions we have, um, even at the beginning level, um, what your comments may be as to um, how do we study, how do we study this? What are effective, in this case, in court models, which individuals will be sampled if we are to do human cell atlases of individuals for a given phenotype, whom will be studied, how many will be studied, and how will we think of analyses in which we could quantify the increased risk? I mean, what are the kinds of things we will need to analyze in order to understand why a given individual who's got say 50 blood pressure increasing alleles as opposed to somebody who's got only 10 as to how come their blood pressure differs say by 20 or 30 millimeters of mercury something of that sort so if any of you have any comments we still have time in order to discuss these, but of course, there are other issues uh, which may be much more pertinent to you that you can raise your hand in the room or virtually you can put in the chat that we could discuss. We have a comment from Michaela. Please. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to comment. Um, so, so I'm guessing like for question number five, these types of studies would not necessarily be something that you could immediately do at like a huge scale, uh, but more limited to smaller experiments, uh, smaller data sets with like higher quality data. That's kind of the way I understand it. So um, yeah, so I, I would uh, maybe like, yeah, regarding the other points, if there would be an incentive to scale up these types of analysis or it's more um, working on smaller data sets and then maybe using um, these technologies or like using a large uh, reference just uh, of single cell data to be able to tackle this question. So I think that would be kind of interesting to frame, yeah, like to what extent you would do these experiments. I assume they will be smaller rather than really the extensive studies in even early GUIs. Other comments? Right. I mean, I yeah. Yeah, unlikely yeah, we're hit, certainly hard, unlikely we're going to hit, you know, big GWAS scale sure. in the near future, but certainly the thousands of individuals, absolutely feasible. Um, although, I, I mean, as we've discussed, we haven't yet seen that, that scale at all for disease samples. There is, um, you know, there's, there's a recent study of a thousand individuals with blood cells. There's a lot more blood cell, single cell QTL studies on the way. I know there's 5,000 samples now being collected from, from UK Biobank, for instance. So that that I think is is going to get us to the exciting point where we can start to see outside the disease state in the sort of population sample, we'll be able to see those those QTLs with with pretty high resolution. Um, but yeah, for for disease samples, it seems like it's going to take us a long time to get up to those stages. And I, I just within you know our the Crohn's disease atlas that we're building, um, we have genotyping as a separate step. Right. So for every single sample that we're getting single cell data, we're doing the genotyping to try to get at the risk alleles. So that data will sort of fall out of the study. Uh, it wasn't, you know, the primary goal going into it. But as people build, you know, if you're if you're at a single disease that you're interested in and you know that it has a genetic component, it ought to, you know, it makes sense to do that genotyping uh, separately. 
and then integrate it into your single cell data. Not at this point. Can somebody repeat that question, uh, the last comment? Uh, so I was asking about whether they were also going to do whole genome. And it, it kind of goes back to it, um, this other issue about you know association and, and risk modification versus uh, maybe a primary causal um, variant that underlies an individual's um, risk profile. And I, I think it's still an unanswered question, you know, in the, in the most of your cases of, you know, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, how much of the, you know, it, it's only because the statistics are giving us this, you know, a, a better signal for the associated modifiers, but on an individual basis, it's, there's still underlying damaging variants that are, interacting with those and and you know insufficient suppression of the the causal variance primary effect and so we're it's both valuable but on the other hand for an individual how are we going to unravel you know that their mechanism you know pathophysiology I'll, I'll, I'll just goes, jump go, go yeah, ahead sorry, sorry. Ahead, no, no, it's just, I, yeah, this is, it goes back to this uh, question that I was asking, um, you know, Arvinda and Daniel before, of, of how are you parsing in your minds the, the, the rule of, of um, associated variants um, versus underlying causal variants on an individual basis versus, you know, very large scale studies. Yeah, which, which is a discussion I generally try to leave to Aravinda. But I will say on that WGS question, I, I do think the um, uh, going beyond genotyping and making sure we're collecting rare variants wherever possible at scale will be important. That's certainly something we've been doing for the studies we have planned over here. So by by end of year um, in the Australian setting, we should have about uh, 2,200 individuals with whole genome sequence data and then blood single cell RNA-seq. So that'll be a starting point. Um, but, but then be, beyond that, uh, being able to collect that that scale of data once once you got the WGS, you know we can potentially start thinking about all sorts of cool things downstream like IPS generation and, and differentiation, um, going back to those cohorts to collect other tissues as well. Um, but I but I agree as the cost of genome sequencing goes down, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll see that as a standard approach that we just apply to these samples across the board wherever possible. I would hope so. Um... Lots of developments, as all of you know, with the decrease in cost and in genome sequencing. It, it is, a, particularly for um, questions that have to do with disease, where I think we all currently agree that the sample sizes will be small, um, that I think getting genome sequence is, is far more helpful rather than saying it would have been good to have had it. So, I think that's increasingly going to be helpful. How we actually interpret and analyze the data is a separate problem, but, but I think that's a problem we need to address anyways. Um, I, th I think it's also important yeah. that you also sequence, you know, do the same genotyping, whether it's whole genome or arrays Correct. on your normal quote population Correct. as well, because you will find people in those populations who carry the risk alleles Correct. who are not, don't have the disease and you can learn quite a bit from those individuals as well. Cool. Um, Gary, you have a question, but before that, there's a, a question uh, in the chat here. Uh, I think one of the things we have to think about is uh, um, this Sophie George says, family history and other metadata should be considered. This, of course, it's the case that um, in individuals, uh, it would be good to get your comments that in individuals we use in these studies, even if they are not in very large numbers, I think whom we study and all of these other background information on family history and many other features, for example, even their treatment history and others may become extremely important to whom we choose in these studies. Uh, Gary, you had a question. Yeah, just um, picking up on that family history point that Sophia made, um, I just wonder if anyone's kind of going back to the old days when, you know, there weren't a lot of samples and looking at family 
um, trees and trios and things like that using those older techniques that didn't depend on the GWAS kind of style of way of doing things. Um, is that something that we should be, those strategies, should we be bringing those back? I mean, the short answer is yes. I think it may be very helpful, uh, again, to look at what um, the repertoire of cells and the kinds of cells and the numbers of cells and their activities mean, for example, in a disorder that's very highly familial. Um, I, I presume since Crohn's was brought up, um, that would be the case at least with some siblings, but they clearly, uh, again, uh, you know, single gene, dis not all single gene disorders, I would even say most single gene disorders are not well understood as to exactly how the genotype leads to the phenotype, but they're studying appropriate tissue from multiple family members may become extremely important. I, I agree with you. We have a comment here. Please. Hi, Sophia George, um, University of Miami. So, um, in the context of uh, the family history, I study hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And so we'll be studying breast tissue, fallopian tube epithelial tissue. Of course, it's not as easy to sample family members um, who do not have cancer or, who, or have. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed is that clearly there are some families that have a strong, uh, uh, big history of, of different types of diseases within with having the same mutation. And asking about penetrance and what which person gets what type of disease would be really if we can somehow use the type of data that we're collecting to help us understand why a mom has gets breast cancer, the daughter gets ovarian cancer, vice versa, or colon cancer, pancreatic cancer within the family, um, in, in females versus males, for example, and age at onset, and how every generation you have um you're getting younger um in terms of the 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 and disease onset, which is also like fascinating in the context of like what's what's happening within the the genome for those people. So we're in the last five minutes, and I thought it would be good uh, to get some even broad feedback from the audience, both all of you online as well as in in Vienna. Um, what do you think are some areas or questions perhaps we haven't addressed? It would be useful to bring back because Daniel and I will have to summarize our discussions in a little while for the whole audience. Um, it would be good to have on record. Is there a comment here? Hello, Stefan again. Um, I think um, an overarching theme of this session was to some degree to, to connect causal or associated um, um, alleles or, or genotypes to the genetic programs and profiles and single genes, and then bringing that up to the level of phenotype. So I think in terms of um, question four and five, um, there are models or computational or statistical approaches needed to infer um, using the genotype that was determined either by sequencing or by genotyping, for example, as in, in Crohn's or in the, in the cancer um, context to infer trajectories for each cell types that might be um, relevant and or present. And then annotating this with the disease stages. So in, in Crohn's disease, I think this is very hard, but even there is, um, I think, um, low, high, medium and high in present, yes. And annotating that on a trajectory that is normalized between zero and one, for example, um, for each cell type that is present, we would, see which cell types are relevant and which gene programs, if we if we are able to explain the trajectory with gene programs and then even connect it to the genotypes that are then causative because not associated because they're related to the final phenotype or disease um, that is really the readout, the pr progression. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Michaela has a comment. Um, yeah, so I have like another general question. Um, so we've been talking a lot about disease. I was just wondering how important or um, how well we would need to understand the healthy system, um, especially regarding um, genomic variants first before we can attempt to understand disease or if it's 
um, sufficient to look at disease directly and then, um, yeah, go on from there. I mean, I'll just say here that I think there's huge value in studying po population samples. Um, I mean, you, you're, although you can't actually draw direct conclusions about disease from them, you can you can certainly, it gives you, takes away a lot of the challenges associated with those primary and secondary pathological issues that can arise in the context of diseased individuals. And it also provides you with this uh, really powerful set of information you can then line up against existing data sets like GWAS, for instance, to say, yep, this variant is indeed a, a GWAS hit, and it's also an EQTL in normal individuals for this particular gene. So you can start to make causal inferences about bi biological mechanisms through linkage with, with external data sets. So yeah, my, so although I'm very excited about disease-specific QTL studies, I think there's, there's a massive amount of value we can get from large scale uh, population studies in the general population first. Yeah, I would agree, but I, I and I would I would say that you know a broad intellectual goal has been that needs to be the study of biology itself, and 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 you know many have said before that the whole idea of studying disease, of course, is to help individuals, uh, but um, you know the whole idea of studying disease that it's often like a photographic negative from which we figure out what normal biology really is and. And, and should look like. So that, of course, is a very important perspective to retain. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I think we are a minute left. We have a minute left. And um, unless there are some burning last questions or comments, I think the last comment may be a very good way to conclude the discussion uh, as to why, uh, conclude the discussion just for today as to why we do what we do, which is of course to uh, understand biology in a much, much deeper way, even though we come at it from very, very different perspectives and training and experiences. So um, thank you very much. Um, to both audi all audiences, thank you for your participation. You've been very participatory. Um, John, thank you very much for your help down in Vienna. And Daniel, I couldn't have done it without you. We are many time zones apart, but we somehow pulled all of this off. And, and it's really remarkable. So have a great day. And uh, we are going to see you in an hour and a half, something for the final report of, uh, in this meeting. Thank you. See Thanks, you soon. Everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, so we have an hour and a half for lunch, and then we'll meet back in the main hall uh, at 135 for the report back. Hi. Hi. Hi.